Good evening, guten Abend, Iyakshamlar. My name is Felix Pilson from the Istanbul Department of the German Archaeological Institute. And I'm very happy to welcome you to another lecture event within the lecture series DAI Inside, a lecture series of the entire Archaeological Institute, where in different months, different um, branches of our institute will contribute. Um, and in March, it's, uh, it's the Istanbul branch. Um, we are very proud to offer you several lectures. And uh, tonight, our lecture, the archaeological lecture journey will lead you, let's say, not far away from where I'm sitting at the moment, uh, Istanbul. Um, and we will um, get new insights in the subjects of building in Byzantium, the impact of the maritime aspect. Um, of course, Istanbul is a very maritime city, uh, close to the sea, uh, and the, the, this particular topography has always shaped also the urban history and the urban fabric. And in the last couple of years, there had been spectacular finds and excavation executed by our colleagues from the Istanbul Archaeological Museum, which have thoroughly changed our idea of uh, Istanbul or Byzantium as a maritime city. And um, I'm very happy that we have two experts here tonight uh, who have also, at least in one case, participated in the international excavation uh, projects uh, under the direction of the uh, Archaeological Museum uh, of Istanbul. And uh, I would like to introduce our speakers uh, tonight. I start with our guest, Dr. Michael R. Jones, is an archaeologist and uh, underwater archaeologist who is currently working at, as assistant professor here at Istanbul at Koch University, and at the same time as coordinator of the Kuda Maritime Archaeology Laboratory, also a new archaeological under, uh, underwater archaeological institute from uh, the Koch Foundation, which is a very important player in archaeology in um, Turkey. Um, Michael got his PhD in anthropology from Texas uh, uh, A&M University. The title of his PhD is The Recovery, Reconstruction and Analysis of Yeni Kappe 14, a Middle Byzantine Merchant Ship from the Theodosian Harbor Excavations at Yeni Kappe, Istanbul. This is one of uh, these very spectacular pro projects I uh, was talking about in the beginning. Um, Michael has a long standing um, research history in um, underwater archaeology. Uh, uh, he was involved in many phases and parts of the Unicapa project, but he has also worked in other uh, groundbreaking underwater archaeological projects in Turkey, such as the famous Uluburun wreck, where he was uh, working on the so-called copper ingots, which are a very uh, important aspect of the merchant load of this um, ship. There is much more to say about him, despite of his young age, but I uh, finish at this point and uh, change to our other speaker, Dr. Alkiviadis Ginalis, um, who is a Byzantine archaeologist and since uh, 2019 a collaborator here at our institute, uh, a fact I'm very happy about. Um, Alkiviadis got his PhD in classical archaeology from Oxford University with a dissertation on Byzantine ports, central Greece as a link between the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. So um, 
this is not so much, let's say, an underwater archaeological work, but he is looking more on the, let's say, the broader canvas of uh, maritime exchange networks, but also harbor buildings. Um, currently, among other projects, he uh, um, is uh, lucky enough to participate um, as a research consultant in the important excavations at uh, Batonea, um, done by uh, our Turkish colleagues. And uh, there, of course, harbor and harbor architecture plays also uh, an important role uh, at the fringes of Istanbul. But uh, tonight, Istanbul or Byzantine is um, our focus. So I don't want to take more of our precious online time and give the word to our distinguished speakers. I don't know who of you uh, will start. And uh, I just want to give um, a brief technical information. Um, we are, of course, very interested about your feedback. We are happy about questions. And you can put your questions already during the presentations, either in our chat or in uh, the Facebook comments function. And at the end, um, I, we will try together to answer uh, these um, questions or react to your comments. So thank you very much. And Kolai Gelsen to our speakers. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. If you could only uh, close the uh, screen so that I can start mine. Yeah, thank you. Okay. I guess this is, you can see it, hopefully. Um, thank you again um, for the kind introduction. And I also want to thank uh, the German Archaeological Institute uh, for this wonderful lecture series. It's a great pleasure to be part of it. And uh, I also, of course, want to um, express a special thanks to its IT, uh, which is always acting behind the scenes and um, facing quite often all these uh, technical challenges. And I have to say it's much uh, harder, much more difficult to realize and organize such online events than I ever thought of. So again, uh, thank you very much. Um, my colleague, Michael, and I um, thought of looking today at a building in Byzantium, but from a different angle. Um, from the impact of maritime aspects, uh, which in fact are the real pillars of this long lasting empire, uh, which is from the very beginning on very, very uh, closely connected to the sea, uh, which is expressed on the one hand by ships as the artery, if I may say so, of uh, for maritime uh, trade throughout the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. And on the other hand, by harbors and other coastal infrastructures um, as the uh, gateways for this interconnectivity and uh, communication. And of course, having the privilege of living in this wonderful city of Istanbul, uh, we would like to have a look at it or at the development of Byzantine uh, shipbuilding and harbor architecture based on the facilities and archeological uh, material discovered at Yenikapa. Yenikapa, a site which uh, was excavated for almost a decade. And at this point, I again would like to thank the Archaeological Museum of Istanbul, as well as all institutions, archaeologists, and other scholars involved for their restless efforts revealing this 
important parts of Byzantine cultural heritage, which allows us today to get a further glimpse of um, looking at the maritime aspects of building in Byzantium. Because as I said at the very beginning, um, if one uh, thinks about building in Byzantium, usually you know, what comes into mind is churches, um, basilicas, and other structures, but not so much uh, these aspects of shipbuilding and harbor construction. But for all those who are um, not uh, that familiar with that site, Yenikabu is an exceptionally large excavation area of 58,000 square meters, which revealed not only a total number of 37 shipwrecks of the early to late Byzantine periods, as we will learn uh, later by my uh, colleague, but also a multitude of architectural remains, including harbor facilities. Amongst the various um, harbor structures brought to light, the most striking features form two massive chetties located in the what we call the Eastern Harbor Basin. What you can see here, these two, the Western Jetty and the Eastern Jetty. In contrast to the very poor state of preservation of the Western Jetty, the Eastern one is in surprisingly good condition and completely preserved over a length of 35 meters and a total width of four meters. The structure consists of two different parts. One, a solid and homogeneous foundation which has a uniform and linear shape, and secondly, a superstructure of large ashlar blocks. Considering the unique conditions in the marine environment, the foundation is characterized by a compact composition uh, of hydraulic concrete, so quicklime, seawater, and an aggregate as a mortar binding material mixed with rubble stones and ceramics. Furthermore, it follows the Roman harbor construction techniques described by uh, the Roman architect and engineer Vitruvius, as well as later by the Byzantine scholar and historian Procopius of Caesarea, by using rectangular wooden formworks or chests, as Procopius refers to them. So what you can see here already are the remains of these wooden chests. Such wooden formworks or caissons were prepared on land and subsequently put in place and sunk into the water in order to be filled with a hydraulic concrete mixture. The remains of the wooden caissons of this uh, eastern chetty, what you can see here, um, indeed show that the feature is composed of a series of individual concrete masses. So as you can see here, the gap in between these individual uh, masses. Four samples from parallel vertical boards uh, of the wooden fullwork have been dated through ventrochronological analysis, not to the Roman Imperial or the very early Byzantine uh, period, but to the period between 657 and 786 AD. So to the middle Byzantine period, and in fact, probably to the turning point between the seventh and the eighth century AD. A dating to the middle Byzantine period is further supported by the upper construction part, which sits on the homogeneous concrete foundation. This superstructure consists of large ashlar blocks, as you can see here. However, they do not represent only uniform building materials, but also a mixture of various reused blocks fitted in. Accordingly, apart from mostly limestone blocks of different shapes, marble blocks and um, 
um, other, even uh, spolia, are used, um, such as what you can see here, the fragment of a frieze block decorated with a band of acanthus leaves. Additionally, the superstructure does not form a continuous level of ashlar blocks. Instead, the blocks, as you can see here, and especially at the lower right picture, these blocks were merely placed at the edges of each concrete unit, thus forming chambers. The chambers were subsequently filled again with a rough conglomerate of quarry stones and mortar, most likely again a hydraulic concrete composition, and finally covered with a last layer of limestone uh, ashlar blocks and stone slabs, uh, respectively. Um, the technique used for this structure at Yenikopo is not unique. It has counterparts. It has counterparts in a number of harbor sites, but primarily along the central Greek coasts, such as the harbors of Anthedon, Larimna, the outer harbor of Thessalian Thebes, or the Corinthian harbor of Lechion, which are directly linked to the growing importance of central Greece as major producer and supplier of grain and other agricultural products in relation to the consequences of the Arab conquests of Egypt in the 640s. But let's move on. A further wall, also to be identified as a chetty, joins the eastern, the Middle Byzantine uh, equivalent at its southern end, which extends the structure approximately 20 to 25 meters towards, uh, towards the south. The wall consists of one row with two preserved layers of large reused ashlar blocks and rubble that are set in a system of headers. Based on their rough construction technique, as well as the fact that it forms an annex to the Middle Byzantine equivalent, a much later date has to be assumed. The extension of the eastern chetty towards south is probably due to the constant siltation process of the harbor basin by the Likos River, today the Barium Pasha Deresin, which emptied into the bay of the Theodosian Harbor. Therefore, the water depth in the harbor basin must have, have dropped by a large extent, and the navigable sea level must have retreated further to the south at some point around the 9th century. This is also confirmed by the shipwrecks, what we will learn later. Um, so this obviously uh, required uh, building measures to reach the necessary draught for the docking of the vessels. If we move further west now, so we started with the Eastern Harbor Basin and we will uh, work us through to the west. So let's go to the second prominent chetty, which is roughly 20 meters long and in a quite poor condition compared to its eastern counterpart, despite its massive appearance, as you can see. It consists again of three preserved solid and homogeneous masses, which again tell us that probably it was built again with the system of uh, these wooden chests. Uh, again, um, filled with this compact conglomerate of uh, hydraulic mortar mixed with rubble stones and ceramics. But the, despite the visual resemblance to the uh, Eastern Chetty, what we discussed at the beginning, the structural composition of the concrete bears some differences. While the concrete mixture of the Eastern Chetty shows uh, more kind of middle-sized uh, real uh, rubble stones. Um, this one has uh, shows more like uh, large boulders which were uh, embedded into this mixture. And on a closer examination, 
one can observe that the embedded stones are not waste quarry stones, but whole river stones, which most probably derive from the nearby Lycus River. But anyhow, the ashlar blocks at the southern end, what you see at the southern uh, uh, lower right picture here, uh, they do not rest continuously on the hydraulic concrete mass, as it is the case at the eastern uh, part. Instead, they give the impression that they are more kind of fitted into the washed out and eroded concrete. This building measure could have aimed either to stabilize the chatty against the risk of collapsing, or more likely to extend the structure further south. As such, the massive ashlar blocks may in any case uh, be considered as later additions. Marble column pieces and a marble impost block with the monogram of Emperor Justinian I have been unearthed immediately in front of the chatty, providing a terminus antiquem of the mid sixth century for its erection. Consequently, it may be assumed that this Western chatty was erected as early as the foundation of the Theodosian Harbor. So around the end of the fourth century or more like the beginning or mid fifth century and underwent a repair or uh, extension during the sixth century. This is further supported by another type of harbor infrastructure, namely wooden piers. Throughout the harbor basin, a large number of wooden piles belonging to piers have been brought to light, ranging from the 5th to the 15th centuries, based on dendrochronological analysis. According to the analysis of a series of posts, almost all, all uh, wooden piers show multiple faces, which correlate with numerous repairs and enlargements up to 40 meters and up to three to four uh, phases of repairs. The longest lasting pier with a usage of over 80 years and three phases of repairs or extensions um, constitutes the so-called Marmarai Iskele 1, what you see here uh, in A, at the western end of the harbor or what we call the western end of the harbor. Uh, while the earliest phases date to 527 AD, so the starting point of the reign of Justinian I, its latest posts are from uh, 610 AD. And um, this will be important. Uh, we will come back to it uh, later. A date around 553 AD is also given for the wooden pier connected to the southern end of the Western Chetty, what you see here at the uh, right picture. Um, this again provides a terminus antiquem of the mid sixth century for the erection of the Western Chetty. But let's go to the Western Harbor Basin where further harbor installations have been uncovered. The wealth of different overlapping facilities provides a very complex picture, which is still puzzling the archeologists. Uh, concerning harbor related structures, the most striking feature forms a key side. Due to the limitation of the excavation area, only a total length of around 25 meters could be revealed. The roughly 2.80 meters wide key consists mostly of a single row with one to two layers of ashlar blocks. The latter, however, are not comprised of standardized or uniform construction material, but rather randomly arranged stones. These represent almost exclusively reused material of bossage and local dressed slabs. 
this represents um, not only this 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 uh, real stone blocks, but also uh, inscribed spolia blocks. As you can see here, one here on the upper photograph and one here, on the right side. One of the Ashla block, blocks features also a hole pierced horizontally through the stone. The hole was intended uh, for the mooring of ships. Besides vertically projecting bollards, what we also get some uh, examples uh, from other harbor sites throughout the Mediterranean, perforated stone blocks or so-called mooring stones formed the most commonly used device for berthing ships since classical antiquity. As for the dating of the key line, an early construction period, possibly also preceding the Byzantine era, may at first be suggested by the building material. On closer examination, however, the construction assembly is of clearly reused context, suggesting, therefore, a rather later date. It has therefore been suggested that the harbor um, at the western end uh, belongs to the earliest construction phase, possibly dating to the initial building project of the Theodosian harbor. However, one gets the impression that the rough and seemingly provisional construction does not really reflect a representative installation we would expect for an imperial harbor of the fourth or fifth century, as we have also uh, at other uh, coastal sites. In fact, excavation works undertaken northwest of the Yenikapur sites so at the uh, light railway uh, site revealed further harbor infrastructures. Among a series of building remains, a 30 meter long and three meter wide jetty with a pier projection have been unearthed, which are, to my opinion, more reminiscent of an elaborate and representative architecture of imperial harbor installations than the key facility I uh, showed earlier. And I totally agree with Cyril uh, Mango's suggestion that the shoreline of the bay of the Theodosian Harbor must have been quite, quite different as late as the uh, mid fourth century uh, with showing a much deeper bay and only with the, uh, the uh, gradual uh, filling uh, of this bay and due to siltation by the Lycos River, uh, as well as the continuous reclamation for the shaping of the new capital um, under the reign of probably Con Constantine I and his successors may have um, shaped this uh, bay as such, uh, we might might have here these imperial, these first imperial harbor facilities of this late fourth, fifth century. But what does this mean then for the key side? Uh, for that, the uh, wooden remains of the uh, aforementioned wooden pier, the Marmara Iskele One, helps us because it is immediately associated with the coastal uh, facility, so with the key side. Uh, it shows a perfect match with other Justinianic sites, mm -hmm. such as uh, Kapidava, hence also suggesting a date of the first half of the sixth century, possibly also for the key side. This goes perfectly along also with uh, examples, other examples, uh, throughout the Mediterranean. Considering the extensive building program under the reign of Emperor Justinian I, which according to Procopius also included the construction of harbor sites, it is conceivable that the key site has been implemented as part of this building program during the reign of Justinian. In conclusion, um, since you might have been uh, confused a little bit. Um, the archaeological excavations at Yenikapur 
revealed, I would say, a nearly complete historical sequence of human activities in the Theodosian Harbor Bay, ranging from its foundation in the late 4th or 5th centuries up to its final rededication in the 15th century. This provides not only information on traded goods and artifacts in daily life, but also much sought after information on shipbuilding traditions, what we will learn more about uh, in a few minutes, as well as on harbor installations and their architecture from late antiquity to the Middle Ages. Interestingly, as far as the physical remains of the coastal facilities are concerned, they nicely demonstrate also the evolution of uh, the harbor activities and uh, generally the use of uh, the Theodosian Harbor. Starting with early uh, harbor activities west of the Lycus River, with uh, probably the first infrastructures with the uh, Western uh, Chetty and also northwest of the excavation area. Um, showing more a continuation of Roman traditions until the 5th century. So this really nice imperial uh, construction uh, techniques. Uh, in the 6th century, uh, we can observe a transition period. Apart from mostly repairs and extensions, what we also possibly observe at the Western Chetty, um, harbor sites in the Mediterranean are characterized by either shifting the entire harbor sites or, in the case of the of Yenikapu, the shift of uh, its infrastructures. On the one hand, due to siltation, also other uh, environmental impacts such as earthquakes, um, further to the west, to the southwest with a construction which tries still to continue the uh, Roman traditions, but we can see a much rougher uh, implementation and towards the development of a new architecture. Finally, in the seventh, uh, the turning point of the seventh to the eighth century, we have a real cut with the loss probably of Egypt and the Levant, New markets appear for uh, Constantinople, and there is a need for swift action. The entire Western harbor basin seems to have already silted up, and only the Eastern harbor basin was still in use, with the appearance of the construction, first constructions of new infrastructures uh, east of the Lycus River, showing new practices. With, uh, with this chamber system, a fast but cheap implementation. Finally, um, towards the uh, late Byzantine periods, um, and definitely from the 11th, 12th century onwards, we can observe a change of harbor tradition. Only the very, very eastern end of the harbor uh, basin was in use anymore. It was tried to uh, make some repairs, extensions of the of the chetty, but at the end it developed more into a small independent uh, scala with very rough, uh, very, very rough construction, uh, which is, gets later in the late Byzantine period very characteristics. With that, I thank you for your attention and I uh, give to my colleague, Michael. Uh, thank you, Alki, that was very, uh, it was very uh, interesting and informative and there's some new material there I hadn't seen before. And uh, I would also, so I'd like to thank uh, Alki Vitis and uh, Felix Pearson and the German Archaeological Institute for the invitation to speak here today. Uh, so it's a great honor to uh, to come here even online. And uh, so uh, so today I'll be speaking about uh, Byzantine ships from the Unicapa excavations. And so uh, so this is uh, you know for one of the Byzantine ships. And first, I also very briefly wanted to uh, 
mention that uh, George Bass had passed away yesterday. And uh, of course, he was uh, one of the founders of nautical archaeology in Turkey and uh, who first to lead systematic shipwreck excavations, including uh, excavations on Byzantine ships. Uh, and uh, his institute was really kind of instrumental in my involvement in this. So I, I just wanted to add that as a uh, additional acknowledgement. And it really, uh, the Bodrum Research Center made uh, this work possible uh, for me and for a number of others. And uh, so, uh, okay, so. All right, so. Uh, Okay, so today I'll be speaking about uh, Byzantine shipbuilding and uh, specifically what uh, some of the shipwrecks from the Byzantine, uh, from the Yenikapa excavations uh, tell us about the uh, maritime economy and society. And so this is still very much a work in progress uh, as, uh, so uh, yes, so, and uh, so it, it went uh, between 2004 and uh, 2013. Uh, so it's still very much a, a work in progress, uh, but uh, uh, so uh, 37 shipwrecks were discovered uh, during the, uh, the process of uh, excavation. Uh, the first were in 2005 uh, and uh, the excavation continued until 2013. So uh, this was directed, uh, so uh, Jamal Pulak from Texas A&M University, who's uh, shown here on the lower right with some uh, Byzantine uh, worship benches. Uh, from YK2 was uh, invited by the Istanbul Archaeological Museum to uh, begin uh, excavations uh, of uh, the first shipwrecks that were found in the summer of 2005 by uh, the director at the time, uh, Ismail Karamut. So, uh, and so uh, eventually uh, Jamal Pulak's team uh, excavated uh, eight uh, shipwrecks from the site between 2005 and uh, 2008. So there were uh, six uh, merchant ships and uh, two galleys uh, dating probably to the uh, late 10th century. So uh, the range of uh, ship types was uh, from basically the 7th century AD to the uh, 10th century AD for uh, what uh, Pulak's team from the Institute of Nautical Archaeology had uh, worked on. Uh, so uh, the remaining shipwrecks, the remaining uh, 28 shipwrecks were uh, excavated uh, uh, by, uh, two were excavated by the Istanbul Archaeological Museum and uh, the remaining 27 were excavated by uh, Istanbul University uh, in their uh, Department of Conservation and Restoration uh, directed by uh, Ufa Kojabash. So, and uh, so this is a, uh, so coverage, of, this is a, this uh, graphic here shows the uh, wood species used for the uh, types of uh, different ships used. And uh, more or less uh, the, uh, YK-11, uh, there are two main types of ships, as I mentioned. Uh, there's uh, YK-11, the, uh, these were, were called these round ships uh, based on their, their use. So they're more or less as uh, uh, used for cargo or other kind of uh, utility uh, work. And uh, the type on the right here, this is a, a galley type. Uh, and uh, there's, uh, these were long ships. They were primarily rowed uh, and they were used for so uh, I'll very briefly go over the uh, excavation methods that were used uh, for these ships. Uh, they, we, they were mapped uh, in situ uh, with a total station, so very similar to uh, ships on a, a land site. And uh, because uh, these sediments, they were below the water table, they were waterlogged uh, sediments, uh, they were, uh, there was excellent preservation of organic material. So we had uh, seeds, wood, and in some cases there's rope, leather, other material like that. Uh, preserved. So, uh, but uh, more or less, this was not a, a diving excavation. This was uh, done on land. And uh, so uh, the uh, uh, ships are excavated uh, and then kind of dismantled uh, kind of layer by layer. So first with the frames in place, and then secondly, uh, with the frames removed. Uh, for uh, this example, this is YK-14. Uh, some other shipwrecks had to have up to four uh, separate kind of layers of uh, material removed. Uh, also, the, uh, this total station mapping was very important in situ because it records a distortion of ships. So uh, they're, they're distorted by uh, your pressure of the sediments uh, over time. Uh, so these were dismantled uh, piece by piece. And uh, this was an important uh, uh, kind of a choice in terms of uh, studying them because it's most convenient for uh, excavating. 
uh, or, or for studying them uh, after excavation uh, to have them kind of taken apart in pieces. Uh, different projects have done this in different ways, uh, including uh, kind of removing them complete or cutting them into sections. But uh, this is a way we can learn the most about them. So in some cases, uh, molds were made. And in other cases, they could just be put into uh, boxes. And uh, four of these shipwrecks were uh, moved to the Institute of Nautical Archaeology's uh, Bodrum Research Center and uh, were studied uh, there. And so I, I spent about uh, two years studying one of these shipwrecks uh, at, uh, for my dissertation uh, a few years ago. So, uh, so that involved photographing, drawing at scale, and kind of digitizing the drawings, using them for uh, hull reconstructions. Uh, so this is a uh, kind of preliminary reconstruction shown here. And uh, we're also experimenting with uh, 3D photogrammetry uh, for these uh, uh, documenting some aspects of these, so with the, the frames. So, uh, so these shipwreck hulls, uh, we don't, uh, haven't had very much uh, information on uh, Byzantine shipbuilding uh, in this time period and uh, from Constantinople. Uh, before this. So the first uh, Byzantine shipwrecks had been excavated uh, in the late 50s and early 60s of the uh, Pantano Longarini, uh, Yasiata shipwrecks. Uh, but uh, we had a relatively, uh, you know, they were excavated underwater. It's very um, time consuming and expensive and uh, it takes a long time. And uh, in many cases, the uh, whole remains were not as well preserved as what we see at Yenikapa. So uh, uh, so these are very important find to kind of give us an idea of the range of ship types uh, that were being used in Constantinople and also uh, on something that uh, is called in the archaeological literature the shell to skeleton uh, transition and uh, so uh, for in, in ancient times and since prehistory uh, shell first construction was uh, kind of the dominant form of uh, vessel construction it was usually uh, basically uh, either uh, kind of fastening hull planks together uh, to make a shell and then adding frames as kind of uh, later additional support. And uh, so we know this, uh, a particular style of this uh, known as a uh, mortise and tenon construction was used uh, in, in uh, the Mediterranean since at least the late Bronze Age, since about 1300 BC. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so this diagram here shows it from the, uh, the Ullabrun shipwreck since we had uh, some fragmentary hull remains from that. And so this style, this basic style was used right up into the, the Byzantine period, but it changes over time. And uh, so you can see on the right, uh, these, uh, these are Greek shipbuilders uh, building a replica of a, uh, a Greek merchant ship, the Kyrenia shipwreck, which was excavated around uh, 300 BC, uh, which was built around 300 uh, BC and uh, it was excavated in the late 1960s. So this, this uh, taught us a lot about how shell first construction worked. Uh, uh, ethnographic studies were also very important uh, with this. And uh, so uh, the, the work of ethnographers, for example, in Scandinavia, such as uh, Olaf Haslov, uh, were uh, very, he had a very interesting insights on why uh, people build in certain ways uh, with ships. And uh, it's important to note with uh, shell first construction, it's considered, uh, it was basically supplanted by uh, what's called uh, frame first or frame based construction uh, in the Middle Ages. And so in some areas it survives as uh, usually for small kind of local vessels or inland vessels. Uh, while in other places uh, it, it continued as uh, it's supplanted by this uh, frame first construction. So uh, this happens uh, during the Byzantine period and it's uh, not entirely clear uh, why it happens, but it, it happens uh, between about 300 and 1000 AD in the Mediterranean. So the details of this are still being kind of uh, worked out. Uh, so uh, one important kind of uh, concept for this is what's called, uh, what uh, uh, Fred Hawker calls the uh, structural philosophy of shipbuilding. And so he says that the way in which a shipwright intends a component timbers of the hull to distribute the different stresses of the vessel that the vessel can be expected to, to encounter. So uh, it's the idea of uh, what's, what's the strong part of the hull, where, how does the, the hull, um, what gives the hull its strength? And so in a shell-based construction, it's the, the hull planking primarily and frames, transverse elements are kind of secondary. And for a skeleton first hull, 
or frame first hull. It's the, the framing themselves and uh, longitudinal pieces like uh, the, the keel itself, like a backbone or the keelson, which sits on top of the frames. Uh, so, uh, so an example of shell-based construction, of course, is this Kyrenia hull. Uh, one important thing to uh, remember about these styles of construction is they're never purely one or the other. So you'll see uh, shell first construction where we use, we use frames as, as uh, uh, design features inside the hull in various ways. So, uh, so uh, the Kyrenia hull is a good example of kind of a classic, uh, classical Greek and Roman uh, shipwreck. It's built with closely spaced mortise and tenon joints. Uh, and uh, alternating pairs uh, of uh, floors and pairs of half frames. So this timber here is a, a floor on the top and there are half frames uh, below it. So that go all the way up the sides of the hull. Uh, so uh, they kind of alternate across the keel and give it even kind of coverage and support. So that's important for the Byzantine ships at Yeni Kapo because we see that uh, in certain ships and then it gets supplanted in others. Uh, now, for frame-based construction, uh, one of the uh, the first one that's uh, that's uh, very well documented and kind of universally agreed upon uh, is the uh, Sir Chilomane, uh Byzantine ship, which sank around 1025 off the south uh, coast of southern Turkey, and uh, it sank with a, a load of uh, glass primarily from Fatimid Syria, and uh, this reconstruction by Richard Steffi uh, involved. Uh, uh, basically, he found evidence for pre-designed frames in the hull. And as you can see, uh, this is a very different shape from the Kyrenia hull. It has these very flat kind of L-shaped frames. Uh, they can be uh, planned out ahead of time uh, using kind of simple proportions. Uh, and uh, they're spaced in specific locations along the hull, and they're, they're used to kind of guide the planking uh, as you build the ship. So these can be made uh, in various ways uh, ahead of time. Uh, they're also kind of bolted to the keel. So the uh, construction sequence of these is very important for kind of understanding uh, what's going on with these uh, ships. So there's a whole uh, kind of series of characteristics that are more characteristic of uh, frame first construction rather than shell first. Uh, and uh, the lack of edge fasteners is usually the most uh, obvious one, but uh, that can, Going by that alone uh, can be uh, problematic, especially when you uh, uh, look at some of the material from any couple. So, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, so basically uh, uh, you have uh, midship frames are kind of the widest and those are usually have to be planned out in a frame-based construction. And then at least the tail frames, which are near the ends and usually there's something in between. So uh, the variations of this basic method are very, uh, there are just many different variations possible. So but uh, not all of the frames need to be pre-planned, so it can be difficult to uh, uh, notice. So, uh, and then the, the third type, which we see at Yeni Kappa is what you could call a mixed uh, hull construction technique. Uh, so uh, we have uh, planking edge fasteners, they're little, uh, they're called cokes, they're little uh, kind of wooden pegs about 10 centimeters long uh, for many of the ships. And then the older ones have mortise and tenon joints. Uh, and so, uh, so the construction features are very typical of uh, Mediterranean uh, shell-based construction, but uh, they basically only build shell first to a certain point and then they add frames and then they build the rest in uh, kind of a, a frame first manner and uh, work with uh, uh, traditional shipbuilders kind of made uh, some sense of this because uh, Olaf Hasloff talked to uh, some in Norway who are building in a similar way where they build uh, shell first clinker construction, which is overlapping planks like uh, Viking ships more or less, and then kind of thicker uh, sides that are frame first uh, on the top. And the, uh, the shipbuilder said basically he likes it because he can um, adjust the construction as he goes. He can, and uh, basically the bottom part of the hull is the hard part to, uh, to shape and to use. And the, hard, the top part can only really go one way or kind of making the side. So the bottom through the, the lower part of the side is really the part where you, you tend to see these shell-based methods for a, um, a, a construction. Uh, and so uh, this, this idea of having a, a philosophy or concept of shipbuilding is important because the edge fasteners, uh, they can be, uh, there can be many different varieties of how you connect the planks together, but the basic ideas are, there's only really a few ways you could do it. Uh, and so this uh, example in the lower right, this is from Christian LeMay's uh, uh, 
study of uh, Dutch ships found in Copenhagen's harbor from the 17th century. Uh, Dutch shipbuilding used these temporary kind of framing, uh, little cleats, and uh, they nail everything together. And then after the frames are in, they pull those out, they plug the holes. So there are different ways to do that. Uh, you don't necessarily need uh, edge fasteners. Uh, so uh, I'll quickly uh, kind of discuss uh, some of the, uh, the shipwrecks that the uh, INA uh, worked on at this site. And uh, they're, as I mentioned, they're fairly typical for the, uh, the entire assemblage. Uh, there's, uh, it, it doesn't represent the earlier material quite as well, uh, fifth to seventh century, but uh, we have one seventh century shipwreck. Uh, and there is a wider variety, of course, that are being studied by Istanbul University. Uh, so, uh, but this is, uh, this is a material uh, that uh, I'm most familiar with and we can kind of uh, discuss a little bit more. Uh, and of course, as I mentioned, it takes uh, many years to uh, really properly document uh, one of these hulls. Uh, so, uh, so this is uh, YK11. Uh, this is the earliest one that INA worked on. This was uh, studied by Rebecca Ingram for a dissertation. Uh, this was uh, found on the western end of the site. Uh, as we heard from Alkyavitis, that was an area that was sort of silted up first. And uh, this was in a very kind of muddy sort of estuary area. And there's a lot of uh, uh, garbage, just broken pottery and, and pieces of, of rope and things like that, that were dumped in this area. So uh, we think that it was buried as a, it was uh, abandoned as a derelict. Uh, it also had a fair amount of uh, teredo worm damage on the top parts of the, uh, the things, of the, uh, the frames. Uh, so, uh, so this was built with unpegged mortise and tenon joints. And so you see an example up here in the upper left. As I mentioned, uh, mortise and tenon joinery is very typical from the Bronze Age through the, uh, the Roman uh, Imperial period. And over time, these mortise and tenons, they become smaller and become uh, spaced further away from each other. Uh, and by the sixth and seventh century, you're starting to see them uh, no longer being pegged. They're put in wider mortises than uh, they can fit. And so, uh, Richard uh, Steffi, who uh, studied the seventh century Asiata shipwreck had a theory about this. And he thinks that their function at this point is just to align the planking during construction. They're not, they're not supposed to uh, contribute strength to the hull of the ship itself. Uh, so uh, uh, so this, is, this is fairly typical for an early, early or mid seventh century ship, what you would expect. Uh, it's small, only about 11 meters. It would be a very shallow draft. So. Uh, and uh, it has alternating floors and pairs of half frames. So that's, that's fairly standard. It's not too, uh, uh, one of the closest parallels is actually from the Western Mediterranean. So it's, it's a West, uh, Mediterranean wide sort of uh, ship that you'd expect to see uh, uh, basically anywhere. Um, one of the interesting parts about this wreck, however, is uh, the repairs to it. So you see uh, the blue basically represents the original pieces in this uh, ship. So it was originally built with mortise and tenon joints, and then these planks were replaced and uh, these frames were replaced. So it was heavily, heavily repaired. We're looking at something with more uh, repairs than original pieces at this point. So this was heavily used. Uh, and this is also a very good warning about studying uh, ship construction. If you're just diving on a shipwreck and you can't take the shipwreck apart, uh, especially if it's from this time period, uh, you may miss some uh, important details. Uh, uh, the next uh, kind of chronologically uh, that the INA team worked on was uh, this shipwreck. This is YK-23. Uh, this dates to probably the late 8th to early 9th century uh, based on coin finds and stratigraphy. And uh, it also had alternating floors and pairs of half frames. Uh, the material changed. Uh, as a, uh, uh, On the slide, I mentioned that uh, YK-11 was built mainly with uh, pine. There's some oak used for frames and the keel timbers. Uh, but that's very typical also of ancient ships. Uh, it's what Theophrastus recommends for uh, merchant ship construction. Uh, but uh, this one was built entirely of oak and uh, it has edge fasteners as well, alternating floors and pairs of half frames uh, a, and sort of a, a wine glass shape, which is typical of uh, classical merchantmen. But uh, it's uh, edge fasteners are cokes. And uh, so they're these uh, kind of wooden pegs instead of uh, mortise and tenons. So, uh, this change, uh, the material and the edge fastener type might be related to uh, the material used in construction, or uh, it could be, uh, you know, some other, uh, some other reason. So, uh, and this is a YK-14, uh, which I uh, worked on and wrote about. Uh, 
Uh, this dates probably to the uh, early first half of the ninth century, perhaps uh, based on some uh, radiocarbon dates and stratigraphy. Uh, this was a little bit different because you can see it has a much flatter bottom, but it's also very uh, slender. So, uh, and it also has a kind of a different framing pattern. It's built entirely of oak and uh, or uh, mostly uh, oak of different types. And uh, there's some ash and uh, uh, elm, I believe, but uh, mostly oak. And uh, it's built with uh, these regularly spaced cokes. And uh, it's not entirely clear. Uh, this is also a mixed construction hull. So it was built up to the first whale, so about the water line with these edge fasteners. And uh, it's also very lightly built. Uh, so um, this is just a uh, different kind of wood types represented. Mostly it was a uh, Porcoceros, although uh, some uh, experts on this don't like to identify these to the species level, they don't. Uh, so, uh, it had a variety of kind of interesting features are these transverse holes in the keel in two locations, which show up in a number of the any copper wrecks from this time period. Uh, not entirely sure what these are for, but uh, we thought they might be for towing the, the vessels. Uh, Jamal Pulak pointed out that this is probably the heaviest, largest diameter timber uh, in the actual um, uh, hull. Uh, so uh, here's examples of the uh, coax themselves. Uh, so as we dismantled the hull, we were able to kind of take them out and see what they look like. Uh, and uh, this one has uh, some damage at the uh, plank seam. And uh, they also have these kind of very long uh, scarf ends. So their, their uh, planks are attached end to end and kind of fastened together, which is very typical of shell based construction. And so we know this was built, the lower half was built uh, with these uh, shell first construction methods, and then the upper half was built with uh, uh, frame first construction. Uh, but otherwise, it's very much a, um, uh, a very shell based uh, style of construction here. So uh, if, particularly for design. Uh, another issue is that with the tool marks, they would often uh, char these to kind of bend them into place. Uh, typically, uh, shell based construction, you tend to see a lot of ads dubbing. So you have an ads like a, you know, axe horizontally, and uh, they, they tend to kind of carve pieces uh, quite a bit. And you see less of that in frame-based construction. So here we have some combinations. Uh, these were sawn, but they kind of uh, kind of carved the ends of them. Uh, the framing on this was also very interesting because we had uh, these L-shaped kind of inline frames. And so this resembles what we saw in the Search at Lamani shipwreck to some extent. Uh, but the floors, uh, these L-shaped, this is a floor timber since it crosses the bottom of the keel. Uh, and the futtocks uh, are not connected. So that's that's uh, also uh, so it wouldn't be freestanding as kind of a, a U shape for for that would be useful for designing the ship. Uh, so that's that's again it's it's an odd feature, and uh, it seems to be uh, reminiscent more of uh, shell based construction. And uh, we also have some grooves and, and kind of uh, mortise holes that show us where there were uh, internal uh, partitions. There seems to have been a bulkhead in here. Uh, this wreck was also repaired. Uh, and uh, the, these are shown as the red pieces here. Uh, and uh, uh, most of these were repaired actually. Uh, I, I didn't mention YK-23 was very heavily repaired as well. It's still under study, but uh, this one was interesting. It, it didn't have extremely extensive repairs, but it had a, a fair amount of rot damage in different places, which had been covered in, in pitch. Uh, and uh, these, uh, Repair pieces were also interesting because they were recycled from another ship. And we knew that because they had additional uh, nail holes and, and uh, trunnel holes. Trunnels are wooden nails, basically. Uh, and they also had edge fasteners in, in the edges of the planks that had been cut. And so uh, when we cleaned it up and we took it apart, uh, these pieces had all these extra holes in them, which is why when you're studying shipwrecks, you need to pay attention to that. Uh, and uh, so uh, they're basically recycling uh, abandoned derelict ships to uh, repair other ships, it seems. But uh, this seems to have been, uh, if I had to guess, it's kind of uh, mid-career uh, in terms of uh, repairs to it. Uh, just uh, very briefly mention that the, uh, these ships tended to be using uh, uh, lateen rigs, which are uh, this kind of uh, triangular fore and aft sail. And uh, for a vi variety of reasons, uh, this has been proposed uh, this seems to be the only type of sail that they're using in this time period that we know about from about the 6th century to around the, uh, the 12th, 13th century. 
And uh, there are various theories about that. Uh, the theory I think is most plausible is uh, Julian White writes where he says that basically the rigging and the tackle and things are uh, actually much cheaper for a latin rig rather than uh, the ancient square rigs. Uh, so we see uh, economizing measures on these ships in various places uh, in, the, in the construction and uh, in, in other aspects too. So, uh, so this, uh, the two galleys, uh, very briefly, uh, these are uh, two of the six galleys found on the site. Uh, the other four are, being, are under study by uh, Istanbul University. Uh, and uh, YK2 is shown in the upper left. It was the first galley that was found. Uh, and uh, it uh, was actually one of the most poorly preserved, unfortunately. But, uh, and it seemed to have been relatively uh, new when it sank. And the uh, one on the lower left is actually one ship. And you see it's two sides that broke apart. Uh, and this is important because on the upper right, you can see a very well-preserved cross-section of the hull. So uh, on the bottom, you have the keel, and uh, on the upper part, you have uh, an oar port strake. So it's a row of planking with the oar ports. And uh, these are spaced approximately 93.5 centimeters apart, which uh, is, uh, goes very well with uh, Vitruvius on when he talks about the interscalmium, which is the distance between rowers uh, on a warship. And uh, so uh, the rectangles further down are showing a uh, uh, locations of bench sockets. And so we had some you know, kind of stumps of benches found inside those. Uh, and uh, on the outsides of the ore ports, there were little tack holes for what were called uh, ascomata in, in ancient, on ancient galleys and uh, manichelia in uh, the Byzantine period. And so it's sort of uh, leather bags that are put over uh, the ore ports to avoid kind of water coming in. Uh, so uh, this is very important for reconstructing the ergonomics of uh, rowing on ancient ships. Uh, we have uh, uh, some examples of uh, Roman river boats and some from uh, are kind of river patrol boats for the Roman army from the late Roman period uh, and uh, later ships, for example, and there's a, there's a small kind of road vessel from uh, Pisa from the early imperial period. But uh, these are the uh, oldest, very well-preserved uh, uh, war galleys that we have from uh, Byzantium. And so these are very likely, uh, we think they may be uh, what are called galea in the Leos Tactica in the 10th century, which are kind of a, a light kind of single banked galley that uh, can be used uh, sort of as, as for scouting, for raiding or for, for warfare, but it's not big enough to, to uh, take on a dromon, which is, uh, you know, larger warships. And so so that's, that's a longer discussion, but uh, so, uh, the uh, other 10th century wrecks uh, we're dealing with, they're built in very similar ways to uh, YK-14, which is from the 9th century. Uh, so entirely oak with these cokes and, and L-shaped frames. Uh, YK-5 is significant mainly because it's much wider, much flatter, and uh, it seems to have some other kind of economizing measures where the keel is rectangular and the uh, frames, the garboard frames are kind of put in uh, just immediately on either side like this. It's kind of a simplification. Uh, it has less of this, this curvature there. Uh, and um, it looks in the cross section, it looks very similar to the Search of Lamani ship. It's, it's more of a, a big kind of wide uh, cargo vessel. Uh, but so it's probably slightly later. Uh, this is a YK-1 also from the, uh, from the second half of the 10th century probably. It was carrying uh, around 45, 50 of these Kunsenin 1 amphoras. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing about this, among other things, is that we have uh, the side of the ship. So it was capsized in a storm, and this amphora cargo was kind of piled up and protected uh, the side of the hull. And uh, this also had a major overhaul. And so uh, the bottom part was built with the cokes and all, entirely out of oak, like we've seen with many of these other ships. And then the upper section here, they seem to added some freeboard for some reason, there's an area where you can kind of have a removable uh, strake for helping to load the ship, presumably. Uh, and they used all these different types of wood, and then they added a lot of extra frames to put these, uh, this, add this extra freeboards. So it was heavily uh, reworked again. Uh, there's also a few uh, repairs uh, lower down. So, uh, so this is another interesting one. And the bottom's missing except for the keel and one one uh, timber uh, floor timber frame timber, fortunately. So. And uh, finally, we also worked on uh, this uh, YK-24, which is a very small kind of uh, merchant boat, possibly a, a, a fishing vessel. Uh, 
uh, I think is about eight by 2.5 meters. It's built in a similar way to these other um, uh, oak built boats from the 10th century. Uh, it's just smaller. Uh, one interesting thing about it is uh, we, it was heavily repaired. Uh, so they, they replaced the end posts basically. And uh, we have the uh, mast step on the lower right. Um, so, uh, so in conclusion, uh, basically, we can say uh, from these, these shipwrecks uh, from the 5th to 7th century seem to be broadly similar to what we're seeing in most areas of the Mediterranean. Uh, and at the 7th century at Yenikapa, we're seeing a, de a design change in some ways. Uh, so a switch from pine and softwood to oak and hardwood, uh, changes in edge fasteners to the cokes, uh, changes in the framing the hull shapes to these flatter kind of hulls, uh, inline frames. Uh, so one theory about, uh, for example, these inline frames is that it's easier to do. So if you, it's uh, easier to manufacture. So if you cut a log longitudinally, you have one L-shaped piece going this way and then one L-shaped piece going the other way, and it's a pair. So you have um, a pair of functional frames, you can put them next to each other in the hull. Uh, so they may be looking for ways to economize this. Uh, but as I was mentioning with this philosophy of shipbuilding idea, uh, of Fred Hawkers that uh, you can see they're not radically changing their concept of how to build a ship. They're still doing it uh, shell first. They still like kind of carving out the, the first few planks that they're attaching together and kind of, um, you know, kind of figuring it out as they go along. Uh, and so uh, one of the interesting things about this is that uh, the uh, Sir Chilamane ship, it's a fully developed uh, 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 method of construction that's frame first. So that had to come from somewhere. And there's been a lot of debate about uh, when that does start. And uh, basically the time periods, they vary from about 300. I think the most popular uh, among scholars right now is the sixth century AD with the uh, Tantura shipwrecks, which are, uh, they're, they have a very kind of flat bottom. These Tantura shipwrecks are found off the coast of Israel uh, and they don't have edge fasteners, a uh, number of these. And they have uh, this kind of V-shape and inline frames, uh, sort of flat, uh, uh, kind of angled uh, turn of the bilge and very flat bottoms. So they have a lot of the features that look like uh, these early kind of frame first constructions. Uh, and uh, the other problem also is between Serce and Lamane in about three, uh, 1300, we don't have many uh, examples. So, uh, but by 1300, we're getting shipwrecks again that's, that are clearly being built with uh, frame first construction methods that are more advanced. Uh, by the 15th century, we start to get texts from uh, Venice that show uh, you know, how he would do this. Uh, and so, uh, uh, so the, the actual way this had worked out is uh, not clear, but, uh, but it does seem to uh, open up the possibility that you have regional uh, variations in ship design uh, and uh, that uh, they're kind of evolving in different ways. So, uh, so that's, that's uh, sort of uh, very briefly the uh, debate about a lot of these uh, shipwrecks. And Yenikop is showing that you have these very kind of uh, conservative traditions that are adapting uh, to new conditions, but they're still kind of maintaining a lot of their, their older um, traditions as well. So it's, it's, uh, it's very similar to uh, a lot of other aspects of Byzantine society. So uh, thank you. Uh, so I'd like to have a whole variety of uh, organizations and people to thank, of course. And so Institute of Nautical Archaeology and the Istanbul Archaeological Museums, of course, uh, first and uh, foremost. So, uh, so uh, so I guess I can uh, turn over to uh, Felix. Or... Yes, uh, so thank you very much both to Michael Jones and Alkivia Desginalis for these very interesting um, presentations. Um, I mean, uh, they very clearly showed the, the wide variety of material and questions. Um, which are involved or which came to light uh, at the Yenikapa excavation. And it's only a small selection, of course, as I was happy enough to, to be able to visit the excavation several times. And of course, also the pottery, the other kinds of small finds, they pose um, lots of questions. And it's, uh, I think it was a fascinating excavation also from all the logistical aspects and a major deed by, by our colleagues um, from the Istanbul Archaeological uh, Museum, uh, also to mention Rami Ahsal, the current 
director who was himself very much involved in this uh, excavation and it's a sign of the good cooperation that we can present this material um, tonight but we will soon have a lecture also together with the colleagues from the museum and we are curious to see more. Now we have several questions and comments to both of our speakers. Um, unfortunately, um, the chat doesn't show me from whom the questions come. So I'm sorry that I can't mention this, uh, but the, uh, the colleagues from the audience will know. So I start with one question in German, lieber Herr Ginalis ist nicht zu erwarten, dass die gesamte Küste der Stadt gefasst war oder kann man auch an strandartige Häfen denken? Uh, I'll give you this. I think you can answer, of course, of course in English so, um, and repeat the question in English. It depends. I can also re uh, reply in German if that That's, is preferred. I mean, since we're the German Archaeological Institute, a bit of German wouldn't be too bad, as you like. Of course. Of course, yes. So, um, uh, die Stadt gefasst wahrscheinlich uh, wird gemeint sein mit Seemauern, das heißt Befestigungsmauern um die Stadt herum. Das ist ein Thema, welches uh, lange diskutiert wurde. Uh, die, der letzte Stand ist so, dass höchstwahrscheinlich eine, die Umfassung der Konstantinopels mit einer Seemauer erst äh, etwas später, wahrscheinlich erst mit dem 6. Äh, Jahrhundert beginnt. Also in der frühen Phase, also zu Theodosius' Herrschaft wahrscheinlich noch nicht. Aber da möchte ich mich auch nicht zu weit herauslehnen. Wir haben nur Hinweise, äh, auch von anderen äh, Hafenbereichen, dass dies erst äh, sehr viel später einsetzt. Zum zum Stranden von Schiffen, also das, was wir auf Englisch sagen, das Beaching, ist eine Methode, die seit der Antike sehr stark verbreitet ist, bis heute auch noch, wenn man auf ein Touristenfischerboot in der Türkei oder in Griechenland fährt, die machen das alltäglich, fahren auf dem Strand rauf. Ich würde allerdings für Konstantinopel das eher anzweifeln, denn man muss davon ausgehen, von einer sehr kontrollierten Schifffahrt ähm, und ähm, welches wirklich ähm, sehr viel ausgeklügeltere Infrastrukturen benötigt hat als Hauptstadt, als, als großer Umschlagplatz. Das heißt, ähm, ich gehe davon aus, dass schon seit der Gründung äh, der Stadt wirklich auch systematische Hafenstrukturen errichtet wurden, um äh, dem, den ganzen Handelsgut und Handelsaktivitäten äh, voll und ganz nachkommen zu können. Ja, ähm, ich kann vielleicht ganz kurz eine Sache ergänzen hier. Natürlich ähm, tendieren wir immer uns dazu, dazu, antike Häfen als, ich sag mal, sehr ausgeklügelte bauliche Einrichtungen zu sehen und äh, irgendwie haben wir alle äh, Ostia oder Portus oder Caesarea Maritima im Hinterkopf. Ähm, als wir die, äh, die Hafenanlagen von, von äh, Elia, der Hafenstadt Pergamons, untersucht haben, äh, haben wir allerdings gesehen, dass es vermutlich innerhalb der Stadtmauern auch Strand, einen Strandhafen gab, der, so ist unsere Theorie, das sind alles nur Survey-Befunde, keine Ausgrabungen, vielleicht parallel einerseits als Werft genutzt wurde, andererseits aber um vielleicht auch Flotten von Verbündeten anzulanden. Also ich denke, man muss sich das schon alles sehr flexibel vorstellen und vielleicht weniger normiert, als wir es heute denken. Das ist auf jeden Fall äh, richtig, äh, was Sie sagen. Es ist sicherlich auch innerhalb des Hafenbeckens sehr gut vorstellbar, nicht der, das, was wir uns vorstellen, der ganze Hafenbereich war durchgebaut, äh, äh, vollgebaut mit, mit Strukturen. Äh, normalerweise, besonders im Fall von, von des Theodosius Hafens, wo ja auch der äh, Likus-Fluss äh, mündet, wurden wahrscheinlich eher die äußeren äh, Bereiche bebaut. Und der innere Bereich Richtung äh, Flussmündung war vielleicht wahrscheinlich auch für lange Zeit äh, nur äh, zum Stranden oder äh, 
anders äh, genutzt wurden. Es, klar ist natürlich auch, für den Schiffsbau äh, werden eigene Infrastrukturen, also so diese sogenannten Slipways, am Strand errichtet. Also das, was wir kennen, diese Schiffshäuser aus dem antiken Athen zum Beispiel, ähm, ist nur sehr selten äh, der Fall und äh, für die Behausung äh, dieser äh, Flotten gedacht, aber nicht für den Bau dieser Flotten. Das heißt, an, entlang von Strandabschnitten wurde noch bis weit, bis sogar in die frühe Moderne, ähm, so wurden so Holzschiffe errichtet. Okay, now change back to English. There's a question um, which goes, the area with the jetties is where the metro is now, isn't it? I mean, is there anything left or visible? Uh, yes, of course. Sure, that's right. It's exactly where the metro station is today. And if you come out from the metro station, actually, you can see those two jets. They are still visible, uh, slowly getting overgrown, but uh, of course, still visible. Yeah. Okay, now a question to uh, Michael from one of the listeners uh, at Facebook. Uh, the Mediterranean boat, the model of Byzantine wreck, and the Kyrenaia hull, they were made in such a way to navigate not only in deep waters, but also in less deep waters like rivers and narrow rocky gulfs. So is this right? Uh, I would say uh, so the flatter bottom boats, they're going to be uh, less uh, suited for uh, kind of rough sailing. Uh, it's just going to be a bumpier uh, ride. So the ones that have uh, kind of that wine glass shape with a, with a keel that protrudes down a little better will be a little more uh, weatherly, they'll, they'll sail better. Uh, but the uh, flat bottom is convenient for sailing in shallow water and coastal areas uh, and things like that. So uh, when Alkyavides was mentioning the siltation of the, the harbor, the Theodosian harbor, uh, that uh, they would have been more adapted to deal with that than uh, larger ships. And so that may be one reason why they weren't uh, bothering to maintain it so much. Uh, so uh, the other issue, of course, is that the Julian Harbor to the east was uh, closer to the palace and kind of closer to the center of the city. And there are, um, uh, there is uh, records of that being dredged. So, uh, so a, a shallow draft, which is what you get on most of these vessels, most of them, uh, the underwater section is about a meter or, or sometimes slightly less. Uh, that's very convenient for kind of going on, uh, going to beaches or going on uh, places that are, have shallow water. So, so it's a very actually adaptable uh, Design. So you have to think about the environment the ship's going to be used to. So, so we have to expect at um, Byzantium basically different kind of harbors for different kind of ships, or do we have to expect that, let's say, larger ships were mooring in front of the harbors and then smaller ships were carrying the loads into the harbor? I mean, both is yeah, theoretically that's what they, possible. Yeah, that's what they did at. Um, at Ostia, uh, mm. but if you want to shelter ships, uh, you need uh, kind of a, a deep harbor for large ships. And so in that way, the uh, the Roman era is a bit of, a, of an anomaly because they're using more of these large ships, what they call the Anona trade from, uh, they take grain from Egypt and North Africa to feed the capital. And so that was uh, done also, that was arranged for Constantinople uh, from uh, Emperor Constantine to the seventh century. Uh, and so, uh, so again, you have to think about uh, the types of ships you're going to be using for these harbor works. So we're apt to see more kind of artificial harbor structures for that period rather than later when they stop that. So, so by the middle Byzantine period, we may be seeing this change where we're getting uh, smaller ships and there's a lower population in the city and there's less of a formal uh, sort of infrastructure for them. As we've mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, just mentioned these wooden piers and things. So, uh, and, and those are also mentioned in uh, textual references to the city too. So. Yeah, that's it's it's a fascinating aspect that harbor city or harbor history is of course uh, urban history as well. Okay, there's another question to Michael. Could you say something about the conservation methods uh, of the ship timbers? Uh, yes. So the the ship timbers they're being preserved in what's called polyethylene glycol, which is uh, basically a water soluble wax. Uh, so the the problem with um, uh, waterlogged timbers is that uh, basically the water replaces the cellulose and kind of breaks down uh, you know, cellulose and other compounds that uh, make the wood rigid more or less. And so if you dry it out, the cells collapse and uh, you lose, uh, they, they start to distort and kind of flake apart. 
So the polyethylene glycol, uh, you put them in heated tanks and kind of slowly uh, increase the uh, percentage over time. And uh, you can kind of replace that with this wax. And so then you need to have it in a, in a climate controlled environment after that. And uh, it's the most common um, kind of uh, treatment for archeological wood. Uh, there are some complications, like if you get iron in them and things like that, but uh, that's what's being uh, done for uh, most of these shipwrecks right now. So, and it's there's a long an, so. There's another question, I think again, for you, were the ships rowed or are there any signs of masts? Uh, that's, that's a good question, actually. For the galleys, of course, they were rowed, but they also had masts. And uh, we're basing that more on um, kind of textual iconographic evidence. But if you have a rowing crew, it's good to sail whenever possible and, and just kind of uh, row into battle. Uh, so uh, for the uh, sailing ships, the merchant ships, uh, we do get references to, uh, I mean, they were primarily sailed but we also get reference into that, to them having oars or what they call sweeps, which are sort of like auxiliary oars. Uh, so for example, uh, merchants from Amalfi, they had a boat type called the Saganai and, and uh, it apparently had auxiliary oars that they would use. So if the wind's against you, you can stop trying to sail into it and uh, you know, kind of row against it or try to row into harbors if you need to do something maneuverable or whatever. So, but uh, in general, um, for ship design, the more uh, round it is, the more like a bathtub, the, the less well it's going to handle with rowing. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, that sounds very lot, very convincing. <laughs> um, yes, there uh, somebody is thanking us for the very interesting presentations. So very welcome. A questions for Dr. Ginales. Looking at the basin uh, jetties and K sides, could you reconstruct the depth of the basin? leading to the maximum draft a ship could have in this basin, thus telling the possible maximum tonnage of ships calling the port. Could there have been larger ships than the ones already found in the area? So I think it's a question basically to both of you. Yes, indeed. Um, if I may start first, um, it's, it's, it's a good question. Um, of course, if we calculate uh, from the uh, two jetties, we can uh, at least calculate a depth of around four meters. We also get some uh, information from other harbor sites around the Mediterranean, um, um, usually based on also on the breakwaters with the mole constructions on it, uh, with a depth of around five to six meters, depending. So this would mean that also uh, ships with a huge tonnage could have uh, moored. Um, as we see the siltation process in the harbor and later um, the annexes of these constructions, they get shallower. Uh, and I think this is also reflected in the shipwrecks, but Michael, you, you can uh, tell us more about it that the, the ship's getting uh, shallower um, in order to be able to, to use this, uh, these infrastructures. But it's very difficult to tell from the siltation um, how this process had been and how deep it was in a certain uh, time period. It needs more detailed information uh, from the uh, excavations. Uh, right, I agree. That's an excellent uh, question. Uh, regarding the, the ships in uh, Guinea Cup, there, there are actually two larger ones that are being excavated by Istanbul University. is YK35, which is 5th century, and they're both early. And I'm forget, I think it's YK27, but I can't remember. Uh, but uh, they're, they're on the, the range of you know, 25, 30 meters, so they're much bigger, and they would need a deeper draft. And it's interesting that we see them at the earlier time uh, that the harbor's uh, in use, and we, we still have evidence for, uh, you know, artificial construction done there. Uh, I know with uh, the artificial harbors at, uh, at Portus, which is uh, Rome's artificial harbor built in the, the first and early second century AD, I think the Claudian Harbor was about seven meters deep, or it's thought to be, and uh, the Trajanic Harbor, which was built inside, was about five meters deep. So, uh, so that's, that's what the big Roman ships would presumably need. Uh, so, but uh, smaller ones, you know, a meter or two is probably uh, pretty good. So, um, 
Yeah, and, and also uh, uh, one other point on, on ship, shipwreck, ancient and medieval shipwrecks in general, they're usually pretty small. They're usually uh, in the range of 15 meters long and uh, most of the ones known archeologically. And that's we have many, many examples, so. Wonderful. Um, the uh, question concerning basically the harbor landscape of uh, Constantinople, so the question with beach harbors, uh, came from uh, Professor Fless, uh, as I just read, but unfortunately still I, I cannot see the um, other questions. I think um, also that would be a question from my side to, to uh, put this discussion with the harbor landscape forward. It would be fascinating to combine these uh, research with a reconstruction of various landscape scenarios in and around Constantinople in these various periods to really to integrate um, the, let's say, artificial harbor landscape into the natural and then again the urban landscape. I don't know if, if such studies are underway or? No, not really, because it, it's a very difficult uh, thing. We do not actually have enough data to get 100% picture of the city in each time period. The later it gets, the better information we get, also from the written sources, from the um, uh, depictions, etc. Uh, especially for the early time, is, it is quite uh, difficult. We are lucky enough to have the information from Yenikapa, but I think this is only a starting point. And to get to a real reconstruction of the entire harbor situation of the city, is it is still a way uh, to, to, to get there. We get, we have already a rough idea, um, but it, it is still fragmentary. I mean, for urban archeology, span it's a big challenge. It's not like that you're working uh, on a, let's say completely ruined uh, site, but still, if you imagine of, let's say geoarchaeological drilling or so, there might be ways. Okay, we have more um, interesting questions. There is uh, one information. The ships are being preserved in polyethylene glucol, water-soluble wax. I think, Michael, that's basically what you uh, said, but it's good that we, we can see it in the chat also. Um, yes, there is another question. Thank you for the presentation. Although all the change in the city coastline, do you think there is still a potential for the research of the harbors? of Istanbul just by diving instead of encountering them during huge projects. Okay, so would the diver in the Marmara Sea or let's say in, uh, in the Golden Horn would have a chance to, to find any harbors? Is that, is that for me? Uh, yeah, most well, of the Well, as you like. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, well, I mean, I, I would say there's been a lot of work along the, the waterfront in recent years. So, and then also, as we mentioned, there's siltation of the older layers. So it's really a, a terrestrial project for the, anything near the shore. Uh, on the southern side of the city, the Marmara Shore also, they, they added landfill uh, to put in the rail line in the 19th century. And then in the 1950s, they put in a highway. So uh, it's, it's uh, and then the, recently at the Yeni Cup, there's a big uh, assembly area for events. So uh, I wouldn't have high hopes for that area. Uh, there may be other areas kind of in the general region where you could do that and find shipwrecks or, or uh, uh, you know, a harbor infrastructure and things. Okay, we are a bit over time. I think I have three further questions. Um, I would ask for very uh, short answers. Um, thank to both speakers. Question to Dr. Ginales. Can you give some information about extra Muro harbors? Uh, yes, of course. We have a series of harbors. I mean, uh, we have to think of that uh, not only the uh, capital of the Byzantine Empire had a series of harbors, but also outside we have a huge range and a hierarchy of harbor infrastructures. Uh, to think of the uh, Heptaskalion or uh, on the opposite coast of Iskidar, we have a series of, of our har other harbors which are partly um, under uh, research and will hopefully give us uh, more information. Thank you. 
And there's another question by uh, Friederike Fless. Is there already a plan for what to do with all the shipwrecks? This is a big restoration challenge. Michael, I think that's basically uh, for you. Yes. Uh, well, the, uh, the idea for, uh, is, uh, for Institute of Nautical Archaeology is that they'll uh, uh, study and conserve uh, those, those group of shipwrecks that we looked at. And so we're conserving four of them and, and going to publish on eight of them. And uh, I, be I believe they have a similar arrangement with Istanbul University, uh, where there's no display space uh, currently uh, planned, as far as I know. Uh, so hopefully we'll have something something in the, the future for that. So. Yeah, it would be a great enrichment for for let's say um, the archaeological portfolio of Istanbul to to musealize this this wonderful finds and make them accessible for a bigger public. There had been some wonderful exhibitions on Yeni Kappa, and uh, so you're really looking for more. Um, okay, there is another, I think the last question. Do you see any evidence of the infrastructure at the Theodosian Harbor changing as a result of the use of Tenedos for offloading the grain shipments from the mid sixth century, as mentioned by Procopius? Um, yes, definitely. Um, although we have no literary sources um, which uh, refer to harbor works uh, at that time, really, I'm sure that the construction of the granaries on the island of Tenedos uh, under the reign of uh, Justinian had a quite big impact on the harbor activities uh, because uh, this all required more infrastructures and um, the sustenance and extension of uh, its installations. And I think that's why we can see all these activities during the reign of Justinian. Uh, although you can all, also already have started a bit earlier, uh, I think it's, it's especially in the sixth century with the opening of the North African markets that we have the biggest extent of the harbor of Theodosius and with the necessity of repairing and extending uh, its harbor infrastructures. And this is, of course, very closely connected to Tenedos, I think. Okay, thank you. I close our question and answer round with um, greetings from Hamburg, another wonderful harbor city. And uh, I really thank uh, again our speakers for these insights in, let's say, urban maritime archaeology. Uh, something which is not contradictory, but of course goes closely um, together. And we are very curious to see what also the uh, KUDAP, the new Koch Center on Maritime Archaeology, can contribute on these questions. Um, I would like to give um, a brief uh, information uh, about our next talk. So, again, many thanks to Michael and uh, Alkiviades, um, but March is not yet over and there will be another presentation um, uh, within the DAI Insight Series, which is organized by the Istanbul branch. It's about a completely different topic. Um, well, I mean, it's human environment interaction, that's not different, but in prehistoric Anatolia, and the speakers are Dr. Lee Claire from our department, together with two Turkish colleagues, uh, Professor Dr. Faruk Okçak Olu and docent Dr. Çiler Çilingi Olu. So we hope to see you again at 18th of March, again via Zoom. And uh, thanks to all of you for your interest. Thanks for the contributions to the discussion. And thanks to the IT department at our uh, Merkes in Berlin for organizing uh, the techniques and to all of you, Iyakshamla ve Görüşürüz. Thank you.